And then are the sad words, the great white throne is set up, verse 11, and I saw a great white throne, and he who sat upon the throne from whose face the heavens and earth fled away, and I saw the dead, small and great, and their judged, and whosoever's name, verse 15 says, was not found in the book of life is cast in the lake of fire. After that time period, there's an indefinite time period that Daniel talks about where God kind of adjusts between time and eternity, and in that instant, there's a very mysterious thing that takes place. We go from from a, a rolled back curse to what Peter talks about in Second Peter 3. And what he says there is that God is going to climactically destroy all the physical universe, not the spiritual universe, the physical universe, and he's going to change it all. And there's no longer going to be a place where righteousness does not dwell except for that one eternal lake of fire, which is down in the bottom on the right. And then... What Revelation 21 and 22 happen, what that describes happens, and that means that there is time, no more. There's no more sickness, pain, death, no more darkness. There's no more temple. There's no need of a temple because you don't need a temple because we will all have God with us for eternity. And what God began at creation, what God offered man in the Garden of Eden, he gives to man never to have any rebellion take place again. He gives us eternally his presence with him. And as the songwriter said, and he walks with me and talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the culmination of all biblical prophecy is as God brings his redemptive people together, both of them. By the way, the Jews are not second class, and the Old Testament saints aren't second class. We are merged together at the marriage of the Lamb. And by the time we find the conclusion, we find everyone harmoniously dwelling together with God forever. And that's biblical prophecy, and that's what God has planned. And I just hope that it causes each one of us to have a whole different outlook on life. Nothing happens to us that God is not aware of. And nothing happens to us that God is not orchestrating for his glory. He is concertedly working together all events in our lives for his glory. What does God want from us, the church? He wants us to be a light to this world. He wants us to worship him. He doesn't want us to build up every single physical possession we can to pass on to the Antichrist when we get taken out of this world. He wants us to invest every possible resource of time and biblical giftedness and physical talents and financial resources and the very energies of our souls to see as many people as he has ordained come to join in that chorus of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I hope someday that when you and I are standing at chapter 5 of Revelation where we began this evening, I hope that you will be able to truly say, Verse 12, that the Lamb of God, you are so worthy. You were slain for me that I might have power and riches and wisdom and might. And I was given the honor and glory and blessing of being your servant, that I have given it all back to you. And you know, eternity is going to be a measure. And it says that those in Daniel chapter 12 that have turned many to righteousness are going to shine as the stars forever. And I hope you don't relegate that great honor to the few. I hope all of you will someday shine as stars forever and ever because your life has been spent turning people to righteousness, not in building up every earthly comfort that can be grasped. Christ's message for our church of our day was, you're rich, you're prosperous, and you have need of nothing. That's where we've gotten to. And he says, I call you to repent, get spiritual eyes, and start laboring for what is eternal.